Hello, my name is Dave Coker. Welcome to the panel discussion. Before we get into the case study proper, I'd like to introduce my colleagues. Uh, Jan? Yeah, hello. My name is Jan Rehlman. Uh, I'm from Stockholm, Sweden, uh, where I'm a partner at Accenture. I'm heading up the uh, Nordic Finance and Performance Management Practice. Uh, I worked in finance for, for uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of years. Uh, I started in the early 80s uh, working as controller and finance director in, in, in various companies and then into the 90s as CFO for a large public company and then joined Accenture in 96, uh, where I have continued on the, on the sort of finance track, but in a different type of role. Hello, my name is Marius von Jarsfeld. I'm a partner in Deloitte. Um, I'm based in our office in Moscow in the CIS. Um, previously, before that, I was uh, with Deloitte in South Africa. Uh, I also did some work in, in the Middle East. I'm focusing on large transformation, business transformation um, of, of, of multinational companies. Dave, what are we talking about? Oh, wonderful case study today, guys. Yeah, we're going to talk about a company uh, called Federated and a, and a takeover that happened in the United States back in the 80s. But before we get into that a little bit, we're going to talk about capital structure. And more importantly, we're going to talk about things that add values to, to, adds to a firm's value. And as we know, there's lots of different things that can add value to a firm. Much of it is tangible. Uh, you can look at the assets, the physical assets that that company owns, and that will add value. It's something that you can inspect. Uh, we can even look at intangible assets, brand names, for instance. And, and we have metrics that allow us to evaluate a brand name for value. So there's lots of different ways that we can add value to a company. But lots, one thing that's very understated or not really appreciated is the firm's capital structure. In other words, the mixture of debt and equity that they bring when they, when they actually capitalize themselves when they start up. And we tend to see situations when if we have a company that has an undervalued share price, they have reliable, steady cash flow. They've got a brand name. They've got something that could be sold, could be taken over. If the company's got low debt, it turns out that sometimes these enterprises can be taken over and, and you can actually use the assets of the company because it's undervalued to finance the takeover and off you go. You've taken over a company and put up no, none of your money. We saw this first happen um, around the turn of the century with a steamship company who took over a competitor used the competitor's own assets, cash as well as some tangible assets, to basically finance the takeover. And it turned out that that company then, McLean Steamship, Steamship had a virtual stranglehold on the industry. And, th and these things have happened time after time. Again, uh, the case that we've got is a study that looked at Federated. And Federated was, was an interesting upscaler in the Midwest of the United States. And what they did was they, they focused on a very high-end retail niche, luxury type of very affluent consumer. And they did that quite well. Now there was an investor called Robert Campanow who was external to the firm and he thought he could do it better. And he became a minority shareholder, started buying shares, and then he actually tendered a, an offer for all the remaining shares at a, at a, at a very, very large premium, uh, by some accounts almost 100% to market. And of course everybody sold shares at that point. They were very eager to dump their shares. Campano took the company over, and long story short, he tried to sell debt, or he did sell debt, to finance his acquisition costs. Uh, Federated was left with $7 billion of debt, and as the, in the environment, when the business environment changed, they collapsed. So we, we, we know that there's three different possible ways he could have avoided this problem. Uh, one would be to actually look at the importance of external factors. What's going on in the larger macro environment? And that's something Campano didn't really look at. Another possible solution would be what's called poison pills or mechanisms that allow us to protect against a hostile takeover. And nobody really did anything there. And the third possible solution would be uh, taking a look at your leverage, your gearing, and maybe restricting it down to a reasonable level. So I'd like to turn this over to the panel. Guys, what do you think? What did they do wrong? What could they have done better? <laughs> Yeah, I think there are a lot of aspects to this particular case. But, but first, a general comment here. I, uh, I think the, uh, the topic of capital structure is very important. And I, I think it's, it's in many times is, is not looked at properly, even in today's uh, business and the market. It, it's, uh, if you tend to follow sort of analyst reports, etc., it's a lot of comments around uh, operating income and then pure short-term uh, uh, profit and loss type of items and, and maybe cash flow that's it but but uh, but as you said in, in initially here the the capital structure it, how that how 
how the structure is is, is a key component uh, of the value of the company. Uh, while it's it's quarter by quarter measures on operating income, usually it gets sort of the headlines. Interesting. Uh, so so I, I think that that's a reflection I I, I, I I've, uh, usually quite frequently uh, are doing when 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 sort of reading reports, see how how how, uh, how companies are looked upon and valued. Uh, so just a general reflection. Very good. Yeah. I think add on top of that is that you know. Um, uh, Sometimes investors will move into a business and they would um, try to uh, blindly use experience that they had in a previous environment and perhaps ignore some of the, the success factors that is, that is what, what's, that's making that business successful. You know, this, this specific company, and I think um, later on it, it, it become it's sort of Macy's and, and, and that's a very well-known brand. Um, but it was it was it was focused on the high end market. It was a niche market that it was focused on, and as well as um, the the products that they sell and was was all geared around that, and to and to push that and to and, and not understanding um, the all the all the, the the values around that, and then try to generalize that and push it out into the broader broader environment for the broader co consumer. It's not a Kmart. It's not a Walmart. It's Macy's. Um, and, and I think that is one of the big mistakes that, that, that's, that's happened here. Yeah. Very good. It's almost like he had a cookie-cutter formulaic approach, and he had done it perhaps with other companies. He was going to try and do it here. Correct. Exactly. I, I agree completely. I, I, this particular case has, has yes, there are, there, are, there are things around the capital structure, but that's not where the problem initially uh, was. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, he, uh, he tried to push some, uh, uh, a business model uh, out in the market that wasn't there, um, and, and uh, eventually uh, the sort of capital structure that sort of was, was founded around that it caught up with him and, and, and created big problems. But he, initially, he he went out on uh, to, to to create a company on uh, on the market that, w that wasn't. He hadn't done his homework when he uh, did the takeover. Simple as that. Exactly. He, he hadn't figured out the strategy and, and sorted out whether this his business idea really would work. In the broader environment. In the broader environment, yeah. and, and, and took a big investment and he to push some sort of idea he had, but, but the idea proved to be wrong. Yeah, the thing that I'm always struck by with these is that these guys, they put their own money up just to acquire, and then they want to get their own capital back very as quickly. Soon as possible. That's right, so it's not like an owner-operator where he's going to put $7 billion up and run it. Mm. So he right. doesn't care. He just wants to get his money back, and he did. He did get his money back, but look at all the value that was destroyed yes. because of this. Correct, correct. And also, what, what, what I think that is that, you know, even if, if, if that's your approach, then I would, I, would, I would make a lot of effort to keep together the management that made this a success um, and keep that, try to keep that as close as possible so that the, the business as such can keep on running and take into consideration their knowledge and their experience within the organization. Yeah, very good point. Because, mm -hmm. of course, the first thing he did was get rid of the naysayers. He, he, yeah, but, right, but obviously he... he he probably believed so strongly in his own idea, and, and mm -hmm. assuming that the current management uh, they were underperforming and, and had not reaped the big Correct. market that he thought was out there. Uh, I guess it proved that he, he wasn't right. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it raises a good point because it's very common these days, at least, uh, it wasn't back then, for management to adopt poison pills. Mm -hmm. and, and one very classic type of pill is what's called a people pill. All the top management, and maybe a couple layers down, in their contract is stated that if there's a hostile takeover, they leave immediately or within 60 days, whatever, with a very generous golden parachute, mm -hmm. and they can't work in the industry for a certain amount of time. And right. so you'd be think twice about taking a company like that over mm -hmm. if you know experienced management is going to be forced out. Correct. And yeah, and, yeah so it's, it's very fascinating. But what yeah. about, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. no. What, what, what about the board, though? I mean, where was the board in all this, do you think? Because he was allowed to ratchet the leverage up for up to 30 to 1. So he was mm -hmm. approximating a gearing ratio that you commonly see in Japanese manufacturers. You don't see it in American companies. Even the banks at that time were running 10 to 1 leverage. Mm -hmm. So it makes you wonder what the board was up to. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. it, it comes back to the, the importance of the board and how active the board must be. You know, it is quite flattering to be on a board of company X, Y, and Z, but I think people don't always understand the responsibility that you as a board member have towards the company, but also towards the shareholders and to the employers of the company. Exactly. That you, and, you know, to... Um, to have uh, board memberships of six, seven, eight, ten companies, I don't think you can add the value that you're required to add. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think in the, you're right. I mean, the, the, the board uh, uh, is key for, <laughs> for how the company is being run and the direction and all of that. Uh, I, it was probably not the case here. I mean, the, he was running the show, mm -hmm. uh, taking over and making big, invest, big investments here and probably appointed uh, His own guys. Uh, sort of yes-sayers in, 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 in the board that did what he told them to do, uh, basically, so without any other concerns on what was right or wrong. Um, I think a valuable lesson for our audience is, is you know, um, that, that, that's natural. Natural is the more successful you become, the more you believe you, do, you are not, um, you, 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 you are sort of immune to any, to any problems. So you sort of, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I am successful and, and, and what I say is the right thing to do. And people, you know, in those positions sometimes have to stand back and you have to look and you have to listen to what's happening around you. Um, and not always take your cookie cutter and put mm. it in an in a organization. Mm. So it's almost like we're seeing another failure of corporate governance. The board yes, doesn't really yeah, do anything. Yeah, I, I think that was the key, key problem here. Uh, uh, obviously, then, then spilling over into the capital structure, but, but the, what all initiated was the, the wrong direction of the company. Understood. And, and, uh, uh, it may have been executed right, but the, it was based on the wrong strategy. Correct. Uh, uh, and, then, good. and then created a problem. So, I assume I, I think that there were some different alternatives in in this case. It, uh, uh, it seems like probably they were not they were not directly applicable unless you you just focus on the sort of capital structure issues here. Uh, my my view would be that yes, sure, but but the the problem didn't wasn't created there. Very good. All right, some amazing talk from the panel again, and a, and a very wide-ranging discussion. It seems like we sort of z circled back to the idea that corporate governance, once again, was at failure here, that there were problems with the capital structure. There may have been problems with the execution, but at the end of the day, it was really the board and their failures that sort of drove this, this company into bankruptcy. On behalf of the panel, my name is Dave Coker. Thank you.